Good morning and welcome. This is 10 Years Hence. Our focus today shifts from globalization and great power politics to the subject of U.S. foreign policy and China. Interestingly, both of those seem to be in the news. Our speaker this morning, Professor Joshua Eisenman, comes to us from across the quadrangle and the Keos School of Global Affairs here at Notre Dame. Joshua Eisenman is Associate Professor of Politics at Notre Dame and Senior Fellow for China Studies at the American Foreign Policy Council. His research focuses on the political economy of China's development and its foreign relations with the global south, particularly Africa. His work has been published in top academic journals, including World Development, the Journal of Contemporary China, Global Environmental Politics, and the Journal of International Development, as well as popular outlets such as the Wall Street Journal and Foreign Policy. Professor Eisenman's book, China and Africa, A Century of Engagement, is co-authored by Ambassador David H. Shin. It was named one of the best international relations books for 2012 by Foreign Affairs magazine. The book's updated, uncensored Chinese edition was published in 2020 by the Chinese University of Hong Kong Press. In China Steps Out, Beijing's major power engagement with the developing world, Eisenman and Eric Higginbotham analyzed China's policies toward countries in the global south. His next book, with Ambassador Shin on China's political and security relations with Africa will be published later this year by Columbia University Press. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the stage of Jordan Auditorium, Professor Joshua Eisenman. Thanks so much, Jim, I really appreciate it. You guys can hear me all right? Oh, you're loud. All right, well, thanks for taking uh, time to uh, join me here today um, and uh, talk about this really important topic. Um, I want to apologize for those of you who might have come uh, the last time, and I uh, kind of had a goof. I apologize, I'm sorry, but I'm here today, and thanks for coming back. Um, so today what I want to do is my comments are going to cover three topics. First, I want to talk to you about the structural problems that are dogging China, its economy and its society. Then I'm gonna to talk to you about China's global intentions, what China wants. And then finally, what does it mean for US policy? But before doing that, I wanna begin with three basic observations, which I think are often glossed over, misunderstood, or simply not paid much attention to. And if we understand these three things, I think it gives us essential context for the rest of the discussion. First and foremost, the rulers of China, the Communist Party of China, are a political party. They're a political organization, first and foremost. And their objectives are political. That is, number one, keeping control over China. Their means may be economic, their means may be military, their means may be political, but their ends are always political. Which is to say, if the Communist Party of China gets rich and loses China, it would not be satisfied. And we do have historical example, the Kuomintang or KMT party, which had ruled China until it was defeated by the Communist Party in 1949, moved to Taiwan as the richest party in Asia. It had amazing amounts of wealth through its corruption and all types of enterprises. Ultimately, it was not enough to keep China, so they moved to Taiwan. They still remain today one of the richest parties in the world, although they've now lost control of Taiwan too. To my understanding, the KMT has the dubious distinction of being the only political party to lose control of two countries. But they're still rich, and the Communist Party learned this lesson well. They have no interest in getting rich if it costs them China. So their number one goal is political, and that's control China. Number two, over time, the Communist Party of China has changed substantially. And those people who would suggest 
that the Communist Party of today is the Communist Party of yesterday are not only wrong, but they are so wrong that it would be hard to be more wrong, which is to say that the Communist Party of China began with what you think it is, a communist party led by a communist named Mao Zedong, and they had communes. In fact, the commune, and I wrote a book about this if you need a cure for insomnia, it is the biggest institution the world has ever known. But it was dismantled by the Communist Party of China. They got rid of it. And ever since then, they've been moving to the right of the political spectrum to the point that I would argue that today, the Communist Party of China, which runs concentration camps, is the most rightist party you'll ever find in the world, maybe. I mean, Putin may argue. But this is an ultra-rightist party. This is not a party of the working class. This is not a party of the workers of the world unite. This is a party of China, a party of reclaiming what is Chinese and defending the Chinese-ness. This is Chinese National Socialism. Third, the lesson that every child in China learns is called the century of humiliation. And this basic idea is that the West is rapturous, the West took over the world, it created colonialism, it dominated China, it destroyed the greatness and the grandeur of China, and that that greatness and grandeur was brought back by new China, which was founded by the Communist Party of China. So the Communist Party of China is the white knight that saved China from the debauchery of Western colonialism. And had the Communist Party of China not done this, China would remain poor and subjugated today. And these three elements are essential basic understandings. And if you don't understand them, or if you mirror image your own views instead of them, the rest of what I'm gonna say probably won't make much sense. Political organization first, transition from leftist to rightist, and the century of humiliation. So now let's get on to our structural problems. As many of you know, China maintained the fastest growth of any economy ever, and for most of my life, that seemed unstoppable. It became the factory floor of the world. But now, as many of you also no doubt know, China's economy is slowing considerably. And what I'm about to suggest is that there is actually precious little the Communist Party of China and its leaders can do to stop that. Because the fundamental problems that are dogging the Chinese economy are long-term and structural problems. So lifting zero COVID is certainly a good thing. It takes the foot off the neck of the economy. But it does not alleviate these three major problems. And I like to summarize them as the three Ds. The first and most important of these three Ds is demographics. China is an old and male country. It's China's population last year shrank for the first time in six decades. And in Sichuan province, one of the biggest provinces in China, as large as any European country, one out of every five people in the province is over 60 years old. Just the other day, they instituted a new policy which allows people to register as many children as they like in Sichuan province, and you don't even have to be married. And for China, that's quite revolutionary, since in the past you, you had strict controls called the One China Policy, and you couldn't even register children out of wedlock. So now these bounds have been taken off, and this should give you a sense of how panicked they are about the demographic problems. Now, China isn't the only country in East Asia facing demographic problems, right? Japan, Korea, Taiwan, all face aging civilizations. But China's problem is bigger and more severe than others, in part because it is accompanied with a demographic problem with regard to gender imbalance. There are now 20 million more men in China than women. It is that's the population of Canada, okay? It is very hard to solve your demographic problem when you are that skewed in terms of gender. And so this also leads to a host of social problems. 
including trafficking and prostitution, exploitation, monetization, right, which are themselves problematic. But ultimately, it is very hard to grow when your population is shrinking. In fact, I don't know that it's ever been done. So the idea that China can simply return to high growth when its population is old and retiring and shrinking, it would buck history. But that's not the only problem. If it were the only problem, then one could consider possible remedies to target this problem, and they are. But dictatorship, the second D, is also dogging China, and it's not going anywhere. There is a security state in China, and that security state costs money. These people who are sitting in these rooms following the internet and doing this great firewall and tracking the cameras, that security state is a burden on the Chinese economy. It costs money to run it, and it's growing, right? Because once created, these kinds of institutions usually get bigger. So you've got a security state you cannot get rid of, which is getting bigger every day. You've got a series of concentration camps in Xinjiang that have been built and are now running and are full of a million or two million people. This is a drain on the resources of the Chinese economy and of that province in particular. These are people who could be working but are not working. Right? And not only that, you're feeding them, you're paying for them, you're re-educating them, which is costly. Okay? So the security state is a burden, but it's more than that. The dictatorship is now getting into the technology sector, the education sector, the real estate sector, right? the banking sector. And all of this has, we're in a business school, non-market outcomes. Right? You start lending money just because you know the political consequences of an economic decline are, are too severe for you. So you're not doing it because it's the right thing to do. You're doing it because it's the right thing to do politically, which takes us back to my first point. The politics are in the lead. Now we have a situation where Xi Jinping has mandated that party cells exist in every single economic entity in China, including foreign enterprises. So if you go to Ernst & Young, you will find people walking around with a badge of the Communist Party because they're members of the Communist Party cell in Ernst & Young, okay? In those businesses in Shanghai, in those gleaming towers. And this is an added burden onto these businesses at a time when the Chinese economy is sputtering. You're adding burdens to them, these political burdens. This increased dictatorship at the lower level is, of course, the consequence of dictatorship at the higher level, where we're seeing groupthink in the extreme. We are seeing, and the zero COVID policy is, is just the most clear indication of groupthink, where one leader essentially took 1.4 billion people and kept them under lock and key for two to three years. That is the dictatorship price that China has to pay. And it's not going anywhere. It's a structural problem of the system. The third problem, the third D, is debt. And debt is largely, in, you know, we could argue it's partly the responsibility of number two, right? That when you own all the banks and you force the banks to loan money to your state-owned enterprises who are not productive, you are going to create a burden of debt. And that's what has happened. Time and again, China has bailed out and bailed out, and now we're in a position where China, which has GDP, which has gone up extremely, right? We know this, has gone from a situation where in 2008, China's GDP debt ratio was 140%. Today, it is 286%. Actually, excuse me, that was in 2021. Now it's worse, right, after zero COVID. 286, okay? And this is at a time at high GDP growth. It's about three times the Chinese economy. That's the debt overhang. When people ask, why did China get rid of zero COVID? The answer is it cost too damn much. That eventually the resources ran out. And so as we speak right now, pension holders in Wuhan, pension holders in Liaoning province have taken to the streets 
because they're seeing their health care benefits slashed because they blew the budget on zero COVID testing people one, two, three times a day. <coughs> this can only happen, right, in a dictatorship, but what it has done is it's immiserated the situation. It's made it far worse. And these localities in China are so steeped in debt that they can't, and, and, and moreover, the main driver of resources for them for years was land sales. And those land sales have dried up because the real estate bubble burst. So now you've got a situation where you've got all of these demands of elderly people, because you have a demographic problem on the system, and you don't have the resources to meet the demands. And this debt problem is going nowhere, right? Meanwhile, of course, you had the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, which lent out billions and billions of dollars externally outside of China. While this was happening, by the way, many Chinese were deeply concerned about this. You know, they said, well, this we're lending during a good time in difficult situations. They were concerned. And they were right to be concerned because much of that BRI debt is not coming back or it may never come back. It's difficult to know because of the opacity of how much debt there is here, but we know that China now has massive internal debts and is owed a lot of money from a lot of folks who probably won't be able to pay it back anytime soon. So you've got these three big structural problems in the economy, in the society. The demographics, you've got the dictatorship, and you've got the debt. And I would argue that these three, when put together, make it very difficult to imagine China returning to any kind of a high growth economy anytime soon. So that takes us then to this discussion of Chinese global intentions. What does China want? What does it seek to achieve? Because if we understand what's going on domestically and we understand what's going on internationally, then that helps us to understand what our policy should be. So for this, I would say there are three R's to remember. So I've given you the three D's, now let me give you the three R's. The first R is revisionist. China intends to alter the existing international order and has said as much directly. The Xi, Jin, Xi Jinping has said he wants to create what he calls the community of shared future for mankind. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of this. Sounds like jargon. To some degree, it is. But it's deeply important because it stands in direct juxtaposition to a, what we'd like to call a US-led rules-based order. The community of shared destiny for mankind, or shared future, depending on your translation, I'll just call it the community, is a hierarchical, sinocentric relational network, which means China makes the rules. There are no rules in the community, except the better your relationship is with Beijing, the better your outcomes will be. It's a relational network. It's not a rules-based network. And this revisionist network, then, has in, in, has international components. It is divided into different portions, right? So you have the China-Africa community, right, which is a subsection under the larger community. And, you know, as Xi Jinping himself said when he explained this community, he said, quote, China champions the development of the community and has encouraged the evolution of the global governance system with this, we have seen a further rise in China's international influence, ability to inspire, and power to shape. So he, he explains what he's trying to do there, right? We've created this so that we can have more influence. And then we create these sub-institutions within it. And there are a series of institutions that China has created, paid for, financed, and now controls, which are part of this larger structure this larger revisionist structure. In Africa, you have the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. Again, fully funded by China, China-Africa. In Central Asia, you have something called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, or the SCO. In Eastern Europe, you have something called the 16 plus 1, arguably now the 14 plus 1 because two countries pulled themselves out of it. In Latin America, you have the CELAC Forum, the China-Latin America Forum. 
And then in Southeast Asia, you have the ASEAN plus one arrangement, which was one of the first. And this was intentional. China created these institutions so it could have agenda setting power in them. So it could engage itself with entire regions at once, bringing them together and controlling its agenda with regard to these regions. It's also been engaged in what it calls UN reform, which is essentially taking a liberal democratic institution and gutting the liberal democraticness out of it. And so we can see time and again, China doing all types of things from the bottom to the top to try to take the UN and exert its influence over the United Nations system, okay? Perhaps the most recent and one of the more egregious was a report on Xinjiang's, the human rights abuses that were happening in Xinjiang. And the, the person who had done the report, the UN, I guess, rapporteur, was so intimidated by what she was getting from Beijing that she only released the report within hours of stepping down. And then China was able to get the UN assembly to vote not to apply its own report. So the UN wrote a report, but cannot and does not apply that report, okay? So this is what I mean by hamstringing the institution. By the way, if you're interested, an amazing scholar named Rana Su Imboden has just written a book for Oxford about exactly how China does this. I would commend it to you. So there are all of these efforts, and of course we know the law of the sea. Again, in 2016, the UN committee basically says the, uh, that, that the fines in the Philippines favor in terms of the nine dash line in the South China Sea is not legitimate. China throws the UN law of the sea under the bus, right? So you've got all of these efforts to revise and change the international order. And so th at this international level, but you also have another type of change going on, which is that throughout my time as a student, China was not selling its model to other countries. It was simply saying, you do you, I do me, we're both equally good, no problem. But what has happened under Xi Jinping is that China is now saying that its model of political governance, its democracy is better than Western liberal democracy. And if you, I would commend to you about a year ago, Putin and Xi put out a joint statement. And in that statement, they specifically say that, that they've got a better form of democracy than the West. Right? And they've been bringing in African and people from all around the world to train them in the Chinese model of political development. Cadre training, they've invested quite a lot in this. And they've encouraged countries to imitate them. I guess this is the kind of old Oscar Wilde statement, right? Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery that mediocrity can pay to greatness, right? That, that, these, that you affirm your own legitimacy by others imitating you through external validation because China doesn't have elections. So how does the Communist Party of China legitimize itself? In part through external legitimacy. And so this, this dual effort to, on one hand, change the international system and change the way nations interact through the community, and at the same time engage bilaterally to help countries to change their democracies to make them more similar to China. Now, this hasn't necessarily been all that effective, and we can talk about uh, why. I mean, actually, I would say that parts of it have been more effective than others. But in any case, you've got these two types of revisionism that China is engaging in, right? Very much an anti-the-end-of-history approach that China is engaging in. The second R is revanchism. Revanchism. China supports Russia in Ukraine. That's a revanchist claim. Russia wants to retake Ukraine. However, China also has a whole list of revanchist claims of its own. We have stood, we have watched over the last few years as China has extended its domination over Hong Kong. Arguably, that was happening at some point anyway. Hong Kong's part of China. I certainly don't dispute that. Now, we see China increasingly threatening 
the people of Taiwan. And I'm not gonna get into a discussion here about whether Taiwan is part of China. That's kind of irrelevant. What Taiwan is, is it's a free place where people live and elect their own leaders. And that, if Beijing had its choice, would not be the case. It seeks to change that status quo, to assert its control. It seeks to assert its control over the South China Sea, in spite of the UN. It seeks to assert its control and has territorial claims with regard to Vietnam, the Philippines, Indonesia, Korea, Japan, India, Nepal, Bhutan, and I could probably come up with a couple more. All of these countries have active tension with China over territorial claims that China claims are indisputable parts of its territory. Just two weeks ago, a Philippine ship tried to land on a disputed territory and the Chinese Navy shined lasers in the eyes of the pilots. This is not the first time. This happened to the United States in Djibouti. This happened to the Australians as well. This kind of behavior, as well as we saw, I don't know if you guys saw on CNN, they had a CNN journalist in the American EP3 or whatever it's called that flies right along the Chinese border. So it's about 12.1 miles, so it's not, so it's in international territory. And you've got Chinese fighter pilots right there shadowing them. And for those of you who might be a little younger, this, actually, this kind of shadowing actually led to an incident before 9-11 where the pilot clipped the EP-3, went down and died, and the EP-3 had to land in China and was essentially dismantled. And thankfully, cooler heads prevailed at that time and we didn't end up in a war. But right now, at this moment that we are in, we are at such tension, I would be very concerned if a similar incident would take place. So these kinds of behaviors are not conforming with the rules of the road, right? So they're revanchist, they're pushing back so China has its revanchist claims, and it has its behavior, which is also not in keeping with international law. The third R, then, rivalry. China is increasingly in rivalry with the West, with the United States in particular, and this just wasn't the case the, to the degree it is a few years ago, before Xi Jinping. In January 2013, Xi Jinping stood in front of the Central Party School and instructed the Communist Party to prepare for long-term battles. Okay? He ha had begun, even at the beginning of his term, to start an evolution in Chinese policy towards the United States. Which is to say, and I want you all to get this, U.S.-China relations was in the crapper before Donald Trump. Okay. Don't believe that Donald Trump is the source of every problem in the world. In this case, I believe he was both the source and the cause, simultaneously. Excuse me, not the source, but the, the, the whatever. He, he came because of, he was able to say China is doing all this terrible stuff, in part because years before that, before people ever imagined Donald Trump could ever be the president, Xi Jinping had started China down a different path, okay? He's a consequence, largely. He played it. And so this decision, which was taken in Beijing to change the nature of the U.S.-China relationship, is still with us today, and we see the consequences. The wolf warrior diplomacy, the cyber hacking, which is completely out of control, the, the militarization of South China Sea Islands, the actual blaming of the United States for COVID-19, the aggressive attitude towards U.S. allies in the region, support for Moscow. We can go on and on and on, but all, and I, was, and I have a new report coming out with USIP about China's propaganda in Africa. China's propaganda in Africa is wholly anti-US. That's the whole propaganda line, right? And it didn't used to be, is my point. My point is that's an evolution. That level of rivalry and competitiveness and anti-US sentiment is simply not something that I was expecting would happen so quickly. And so the consequences have become clear then. China's relations with countries around the world and perceptions of China around the world have collapsed since 2017, 16. 
In 2017, about Americans were roughly split, according to Pew. About half of Americans said work with China. About the other half viewed China negatively. Now it's 82-17. That's the distribution. 82% of Americans view China negatively. And we don't stand out when you look at the data. If you look at the Europeans, the numbers are even more stark in some cases, places like Sweden and Finland, with the sea change of views. And China's relations at the bilateral level have also gone to pot. The China-Australia relationship is in a terrible situation. The China-UK relationship is in a terrible situation. The China-South uh, Korea relationship is in terrible situation. Japan, forget about it. India, they literally fighting on the borders, killing each other with sticks and clubs, okay? That was unthinkable when I sat in many of your seats as a student, that, 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 that the situation would get that bad. Lithuania and China, even the Philippines and China, which had had a bit of a rapprochement, are now, that's completely off. It is very hard for me to sit here and think of, even, even Pakistan and China have a tough situation right now. It's very hard for me to sit here and give you one country that I can tell you I believe relations with China have improved. I mean, perhaps Russia. But that, in fact, would be proving my point more than disputing it, wouldn't it, right? So China has seen its foreign relations go south almost across the board. And we can see the problems, actually. Look at China's Ukraine policy right now. China's Ukraine policy is, uh, it doesn't know whether to offer a peace plan or sell weapons to Russia. It's literally caught between these two extremes, right? Are you, are you offering peace or are you supplying weapons? Because these two things, you know, don't, fit together, and this gives you a real sense of how much trouble there is in, 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 in terms of understanding Chinese foreign policy. And so what does this mean for U.S.-China relations then? Well, let me get a sip of water here. Well, first I would say that the current situation is the result of various factors, as everything is, but the primary one is not some systematic struggle, Thucydides trap, IR theory textbook stuff, okay? The, the primary problem is not some structural rivalry between a status quo power and a rising power. That absolves China of everything we've been talking about, right? That just says, well, it's structural. If the Chinese were, you know, the biggest menches in the world, we'd still have a problem. Mensch means a really good person, if you wish. So, the upshot is that I think that we have put far too much attention on this structural balance, in part because it's easy. We don't have to understand what's going on in China or any of the thing I said. We just understand that there's a rising power and there's a lowering power and then they get into the conflict and it's nobody's fault. That's just the way it is. And I would say that is, it's lazy, lazy, lazy in the first degree. I would say it's, it's part of the problem, but it is not the overwhelming reason. The overwhelming reason is that the fundamental nature of the Communist Party of China has evolved. It's evolved from leftist to rightist. It's evolved from working with the United States on, to being more competitive with the United States. And its evolution in terms of its socioeconomic situation, its demographics and other issues have taken place, which are driving it. Its, its dictatorship, its debt, are reinforcing the problems and making them very hard to correct. Okay? It's very hard when you have a severe groupthink situation to say, we need to make a change and make that change if the leader is not supporting you. So China's structural problems, I believe, are fundamentally undermining the ability of the U.S.-China relationship to move forward in any serious way. So this is, I would say, uh, uh, at the 50,000-foot perspective then, so at the highest level. We're in for a rough ride, guys. You know, the, those of you, and I see a few people in my class who read about democratic peace theory, you understand that the democratic countries of the world are maybe more peaceful towards each other, but they tend to be more antagonistic towards autocracies they find to be threatening. And they feel that China is pretty threatening. That's not a good sign, right? The democracies of the world are coming together and coalescing in fear of autocracy. That's what we've seen. That's the story of the last 12 months, isn't it? That's concerning. 
But we also know from history that autocracies, especially the national socialist kind, especially the ultra-rightist kind, tend to be internally repressive and externally aggressive. That's what we have seen. And whether it be the Baathists in Syria, the Japanese uh, imperialists, the German national socialists, I mean, we could go down the list. You give me a country which is a national socialist country, eventually they tend to evolve towards more constraint at home and some type of aggression. And that doesn't bode well for China going forward, okay? Mussolini, that's another example, right? Where we've seen this problem it tends to metastasize. And the chances of an old male autocracy getting over that problem, I would say pretty low. So it's gonna be a rough ride. And we shouldn't ignore these things. That would be foolish, I would say. So at the tactical level, what does it mean? Well, it means that and for those of you who know me, you know that I, I give compliments very rarely for my students who've like read the, my comments on their papers. So. But I have to say that I think at this moment, the US policy towards China is probably the least worst option we can get. It's probably the best we've got under the circumstances. We're building awareness of the problem. We're building our capacities to deal with the problems. We're building our alliances with countries around the world who are like-minded. We're finding ways to protect ourselves and limit the export of dual-use technologies. And increasingly, we're doing it in a bipartisan fashion, which I think is particularly impressive given our situation. So I think we're doing the, the best we can under the circumstances, which, by the way, is not what I think was happening under the Trump administration. I think there was a lot in that policy that I would criticize. Donald Trump is really good at turning over a table, but setting the table, he's always not. I'm a New Yorker. I've, I've witnessed from a distance my whole life, right? Good at table turning. And he turned the tables on a relationship that needed to be turned. But the Biden administration has set the table. And it has set the table, I would say, about as well as it can be set. But that does not guarantee success, especially with a big and powerful country like China, because it takes two to tango. So I would say that we should be modest in our expectations. Right? There is not a US policy that's going to call forth cooperation from China. I don't think that policy exists. So we need to be modest in what we think is the realm of the possible. And we shouldn't be surprised if we don't make progress. In fact, not making progress might be a good thing, given that the more likely scenario is that we actually continue into a spiral of conflict. If we actually come back here a year from now and we're in the same situation we are today, that might actually be a victory, given the balloon and all the other Michigas. So, I hate to say it, but be pessimistic. And finally, what should we not do? Right, because policy is not only about what we should do, it's also about what not to do, right? Okay. First, we should not, under any circumstances, pursue regime change in China, period, under no circumstances. We couldn't even pull it off in Iraq. It is not happening. Anyone who tries to sell you that bag, throw it back in their face, okay? They sold it to me when I was a student, the whole Iraq thing. After, my, after they sold my mom the, the Vietnam thing, there is no China plan to overturn the Communist Party of China. It is not happening. Second, we cannot return to the farce of engagement. US policy can never again be predicated on the idea that we are going to change China, either through, path, either through neoliberal engagement or neoconservative head bashing. Changing China should not be a predicate to having any relationship with them. We have to accept them for who they are, and we have to deal with that. Third, our China policy should not drive our Asia policy. In fact, our Asia policy should drive our China policy, which means we should begin with our allies, we should begin with a larger conception of what we want in Asia, and then our China policy should be a subset of that. To the extent that we make China the heart and soul of our Asia policy, we neglect our allies, we neglect the smaller countries, which in my opinion would be a strategic mistake. 
Fourth, do not believe that if China does attack Taiwan, or if China becomes aggressive, that that's a failure of the United States policy. China has its own will, its own timetables and decision making. It is not our fault if another country takes a decision. And I think that in this country, because of our bipartisan structure, no matter who sits in the office, if such an attack happened, it would become a domestic political football. And I think that would be a massive mistake. We would need to be as united as we could be under such circumstances, not trying to find and point blame at ourselves. Fifth, we should not restrict visas for Chinese students unless we have a clear, convincing reason to do so. There are people in Washington who would do, who would have banned China. I think that's the biggest mistake, the biggest mistake. I think we should give more visas to more Chinese students. The more, the better, unless we have a compelling reason not to do so. If this is a person who is not who they claim to be or a person who works for the military, that's a different scenario. But every student who wants to take my US China class, which is happening in the fall, should be able to take it. And finally, my final point, we shouldn't put blinders on or be blinkered about the scale of the challenge that we are facing at this time. All right, we, people wanna call it a new Cold War, people wanna call it this and that. What it is, is it's the biggest challenge that we have faced since World War II. And we have to get ready for that challenge. It is, in many ways, more challenging than what we faced in World War II because this is our greatest trading partner. This is the biggest trading relationship the world has ever known, right? There is no scenario here that this turns out well for us in a conflict with China, or well for them, or well for anybody. So we have to be prepared for the scale of the challenge, okay? And so even being kind of aware of the scale of the challenge, I think is more is important because there's so many distractions that you guys are facing, right? On your phones and on everything, it can be hard to focus and realize that something is really important. And that's why I wanna kind of end with that, right? That this is, in my opinion, the challenge of our time. Thank you. Very good, let's uh, move to questions now. Uh, we have a couple of microphones. Who has a question for our guest? Sir. Professor, Professor thank you very much. Um, over the last couple of months, <clears throat> both uh, Navy and Air Force leadership have come out uh, to say, hey, listen, be prepared for war by 2026 over, over Taiwan with China. Uh, and certainly the military uh, strategy um, is focused on China. From your perspective, from a political perspective of the Communist Party, is that worth their while? Um, or does China take a longer view of things and say, hey, listen, we'll continue what we're doing. We have really, we'll pressure Taiwan, but we're not ready to take it over. So from a timing perspective, while the US military is saying one thing, is that something that the Communist Party would sign up for? Well, it's a great question. I mean, it's, it's of course the, whatever, the $50,000 question, right? You know, um, my understanding is the Communist Party of China, or, or Xi Jinping has said that he wants the capacity to take Taiwan by what, 26, 27. Um, and that we should take him seriously and at his word. Certainly his record suggests we should. Um, but having the capacity to take Taiwan and taking Taiwan are two different things. Of course, one could argue that thinking one has the capacity to take Taiwan and actually having the capacity may well be two different things as well, right? Given the challenges of taking Taiwan, right? I mean, if we're easy, they would have done it already. What I think that we can say for sure is that the Communist Party of China realizes that time is probably not on its side in terms of it's the way it's perceived among the Taiwanese people. It probably realizes that it's, what it did in Hong Kong had consequences for the way in which it's viewed in Taiwan that are negative in terms of having a kind of peaceful unification, okay? Um, and that it needs to very seriously consider the military option and make sure that that is on the table and not, does not forego that military option. 
but when and if, like, and, and all the details of it, the tactics and everything like that, this is, these are all hotly debated issues. And so I certainly can't give you any foresight in understanding whether or not they are or not gonna cross that straight in 2027. What I can tell you is that the leadership wants to be prepared to do it by 2027. We take them at their word, and it's our intention to deter them. And so US policy towards Taiwan has evolved under the Biden administration in a way that I completely agree with. Okay? We used to have this uh, policy where we didn't say what we were going to do. Right? We're not, we're not going to the strategic ambiguity policy. And the purpose of this policy was to deter both sides, to say, China doesn't know if we're going to invade, so they don't, uh, excuse me, they don't know if we're going to defend, so they won't invade, and Taiwan doesn't know if we'll protect them, so they won't declare independence. Well, the chances of Taiwan declaring independence are now zero, so we don't have to defend that, right? Taiwan's not going to declare independence. What we are concerned about is that China would take Taiwan. That's the fear. So we have changed our policy to a declarative policy. The president has now four times said, we will come to Taiwan's aid. And to the extent that that might deter China, I think that is, again, the least worst policy that we can have, right? To deter China, that every day they wake up, they decide that today is not going to be the day, right? Um, and then to construct a policy, and I think Taiwan's on the process of doing this, which is specifically intended to raise the costs of such an invasion and to learn from Ukraine about what is raising those costs mean in practice. Of course, there are differences between a flat plane and a water, right? But to know that raising those costs has to be a big part of the strategy. And I think they've been doing that. So I can't answer your question specifically. I don't think anybody can. But this is my best approach to kind of how the evolution has taken place and where we are now. Very good. Other questions? Morning, Professor. Uh, thank you for coming and speaking today. Um, one of the questions I have is regarding uh, U.S. China, or U.S. foreign relations towards China. You mentioned that um, we should have a modest approach towards China's, you know, actions or whatever, um, because we can't change them. They're going to keep staying the way they are, and they're going to keep growing. We just have to live with kind of who they are and, and what they're doing. At what point, however, is it too far? Um, like having this approach, like when is it? conflicting with our democratic values of you know, human, human rights and stuff like that, at what point is it, would we stop this approach of having a modest um, relationship with China and, and realizing, okay, now's enough, we need to react differently? Mm. Thank you, Patrick. So to be, just to clarify then, what I mean by modest is modest in our expectations of our China policy. Modest in what we can achieve, right? My idea would be if we can maintain the peace, then actually is achieving quite a lot, right? So a modest understanding, not that we have to have rapprochement with China like Richard Nixon. That's not uh, in the cards, okay? Uh, unless, I mean, hell, Xi Jinping could wake up tomorrow and make that decision. That's the situation, that's the world he's living in. I think it's unlikely. But what we can do is what I said before. So there's a difference between trying to change and to deter, right? We cannot change China. We cannot turn China into the China we want China to be, but we can deter specific actions which would be against our interests, like an invasion of Taiwan, right? We can say, these are our lines. This is how we're going to you know, defend these things. And we can deter China and raise the costs on them for taking certain behaviors. It doesn't change who they are. It doesn't change the fact that they want Taiwan. It doesn't change the fact that they have certain views of the United States, but it makes them think twice, right? So our, our policy should be modest in what we can achieve, and if we achieve deterrence, I would say we've achieved quite a bit. But, you know, are the American taxpayers gonna be like, yes, we've, we've got nothing, what a success, right? Probably not, but the fact is, uh, if, we, if we do not have a war with China in the next 10 years, I think we've, pretty, we've done pretty well. Question right here. I didn't quite formulate the question in my head yet, but I'll just start talking and hopefully a question comes out. But, <laughs> um, as an alum from the Mendoza School, I love, we've got someone from the Keogh School coming over to talk and I, seeing these worlds combine is a, is a great thing. Um, but I noticed in your talk, it, you know, it's all about policy, um, overall kind of economic views. But as someone in the business world, I, I, you know, listening to these previous lectures we've had, a lot of what I deal with and I, I work very closely with our business in China and, and the company I work for, 
But I notice a lot of the people I work with, there's, there's just, there's concern sometimes of working with China and I can see some tension at times, some doubt from some people, um, I believe influenced by their political views um, towards China, which I think are often different than business views. And, and so anyway, in my head, I kind of deal with, I, I don't know, I'm on the fence with a lot of views and beliefs, but I'm like, well, hold on, I gotta set some of that aside because I'm working on the business side of things. And if it's good for my company, likely it's good for my country as well. I, I don't know, I guess just for, for you know people who are gonna be future leaders or current leaders working in a business setting with China, what, what sort of thoughts, beliefs, direction do you have? Ooh. A little open-ended there, huh? No, it's uh, you know it's an important question right now because um, for years, decades, the business community has led an effort to improve U.S.-China economic relations. Okay, um, this was something that actually began as early as the rapprochement, the idea that U.S. and China could have a robust business relationship. People like Henry Kissinger and others have. You know, created very lucrative consulting relationships for, you know, with business. Um, and certainly the way that the Chinese had initially viewed Donald Trump, by the way, was as a businessman. This is very interesting as a guy who grew up in New York next to Donald Trump State Park, was to watch the Chinese fundamentally misunderstand who Donald Trump was. And then to continuously send business people like Steve Wynn and others to the White House to try to convince him of things as if he was a businessman. Okay, so the Chinese view has always been that the business community is a friend of China and we want to work with them and that's good for the U.S.-China relationship. I think there's been mixed views in terms of the way the business community has seen China depending on how successful they've been there. Some have been very successful, others have lost their shirts. And so it can be very case specific as you no doubt understand. Um, what are you selling? You know, how are you selling it? Are you manufacturing there and importing here? Are you, uh, uh, you know, so what kind of business are you in? So if you're, you know, the issue of IPR theft, for instance, has long been a concern for American businesses who've seen their intellectual property rights go. So in the short term, they do well because they can create their widget at a cheaper price, but over the long term, they lose their IPR. So this has been a problem that I've witnessed when I worked uh, on the Hill. Um, Nowadays, however, we have a different set of problems, right? Because we've got this increasingly tense relationship, but we also have China's government interfering more and more in the business world than, than previous Chinese governments have. And so if you look at the US-China Chamber of Commerce and the EU Chamber of Commerce in China, their perceptions of China have really tanked over the last few years. They've gotten increasingly pessimistic. Well, one reason obviously is zero COVID, that there were no fans of zero COVID for obvious reasons, right? They wanna have an open business environment and they weren't getting it, so they were pessimistic. I wonder if, if you might have heard some of that pessimism. But ultimately, um, the Germans and the British had one of the closest business relationships just on the eve of World War I. It didn't stop a thing, right? Ultimately, Xi Jinping has been very clear, as I said at the, my first point that I stood here and told you, that politics is in the lead, and that economics is gonna serve politics. In fact, everything is gonna serve politics. So I would say that, um, hedge, right? What I've heard a lot of businesses doing is a China plus one. Now I'm hearing China plus three. I've even heard China plus X, plus X, right? Which means, yeah, continue to make in China, but also invest in supply chains in Vietnam and in Cambodia and in Bangladesh and um, you know in other places so that if China goes offline, you don't end up like Apple and then you, you can't meet your supplies. So Apple is also thinking of diversifying, I saw to India, right? So this idea of China plus, I think is becoming increasingly well accepted in the business community, right? So that, if I had one word, my word would be hedge, right? Do not bet on that China of tomorrow is gonna be the same as China of yesterday. I would consider the trajectory to be pretty consistent going forward. But then again, when you're in this country like this, I mean, Xi Jinping is a human being, the man could kill over tomorrow, and then who the hell knows what we've got. But I do not think, even if that happened, liberal democracy would spring up tomorrow and rule of law and the defense of property rights. So I would say hedge. Just a quick follow-up. Would you agree with a, a statement that I and others in my company often make, though, is you know, love China, hate China, 
regardless, you need to be involved because they're too big to ignore. I mean, I, guess, I think it just depends on the sector, right? So For some sectors, sector, depending yeah. on the sector, sure. So, so in your sector, that, that may be the case. Um, but I mean, just watch, you know, CYA. You know CYA? Yep, covered. Co cover it, yep. right? I would, I would just say, don't be, don't be as I, my last point, right? Don't be uh, blinkered. Don't be flippant, okay? Understand who you're dealing with, okay? And as long as you go in with your eyes open, I think you're in a better situation because I think in the past, there was a lot of mirror imaging going on. Oh, I went to Harvard, you went to Harvard. Oh, we must have the same objectives. Not necessarily, right? So I think as long as you go in with your eyes open and you're, uh, you know, and hedge, I think that's the least worst option <laughs> at this point if you feel you must be there, right. if you feel you have no choice, right? But I don't know your business, so. Great, thank you. Let me add to your question an observation from the Wall Street Journal last week that said <clears throat> Chinese high courts have vacated a law requiring uh, Chinese businesses to respect and observe international property rights, uh, including uh, uh, technology, uh, including uh, pharmaceuticals. And so if they can either reverse engineer or simply mm -hmm. claim that it belongs to them, how does that leave any way forward for Western business? I mean, you know, I'm glad you reminded me of this, Jim, because they've also announced that they want Chinese firms in Hong Kong and China to let their contracts with the big four accounting firms expire. Right, so this Ernest and Young and all these guys, right, PZ and you, they want this to expire, right? And you can imagine that that would put Chinese firms and Western firms in different worlds, right? If eventually you've got your own accounting firms and your own accounting practices that are not compatible with Western accounting firms and practices, that's gonna make business a lot harder uh, for, for you and your firm and for firms all over the world, right? So I would say that between the intellectual property rights and the changing of the accounting standards and, the, and putting a party cell in every place and I mean, it's, it's making it very difficult. And also, as just a person going to China, you know, you need all these apps and the phone. I mean, there's a whole set of difficulties, right, that make it harder to be a foreign businessman in China than it used to be. But if you can't follow the money, then why are you there to begin with, right? Other questions? Uh, first off, thanks for coming to speak to us today, Professor. Um, you briefly mentioned um, China's kind of Africa policy. I was wondering if you could kind of speak on, I mean, currently the United States hasn't really addressed it or done much to, done much about it. Should they, or should they kind of continue I'm sorry, to, they didn't address what? Uh, China's like kind of actions in Africa. I mean, like you've seen in the news recently with like all the cobalt mines that they have in the Congo and stuff like that. I was wondering if you could kind of speak a little bit more on that. Yes, of course. In fact, I'm thrilled to do so because I have a new book coming out on China-Africa relations, so I can talk to you all day about it. Um, so China's Africa policy has, has evolved um, over time. It had been and largely economic, um, and there are important economic aspects to it. Um, but increasingly, China has focused on political and military relations as well, and so, you know, we, we can watch as the kind of China-Africa trade kind of peaked in about 2014, 15, and then kind of petered out. It didn't peter out, it, it still remained high, but it wasn't, you know, we've just now returning to almost 10 years ago levels. So we've all seen almost a kind of plateauing of the economic relationship. Same thing with loans. China is no longer going to Africa and like building railways all over the place. It's backed off of a lot of that. Uh, approach, but what we are seeing and what we saw before COVID and ramping up more and more is political engagement. So a lot of propaganda. So next week, I have a report coming out from USIP on China's propaganda in Africa. And China is doing a lot in the African media space um, to engage Africans in education, um, opportunities uh, culturally, just a lot of effort to engage with Africans and help them to understand that China is their friend. Um, you also see the Communist Party of China meeting African political parties, and up until COVID, that was really going up a lot. Um, I actually interviewed the Communist Party's international department in China, and they were exhausted. They're like, we spent half our day at the airport, and they have all these demands. I mean, it's funny when people slip into, you know, 
they just start talking sometimes. But there's a, a real prioritization of Africa, which for people who study IR doesn't make much sense, right? They're like, why would a great power care so much about the global south, right? Don't they care about other great powers? Right? But China has decided that it wants to be the leader of the global south. Okay. Now you might say, hey, that, that doesn't make much sense. This is the second biggest economy in the world, the, the second biggest military in the world. How could they be the leaders of the developing world? But that's their mantra. That's what they want to be. So they put a lot of money. As I said, I gave you a list of institutions, right? From Africa and, and, and Latin America, et cetera. They put a lot of money into meeting these people, working with these people, and listening to them. Like if you're an African head of state, you will meet Xi Jinping. If you're the African foreign minister, you go to China, you will meet the foreign minister of China. You're probably not going to meet the Secretary of State if you come here, right? So China has prioritized Africa, prioritized the developing world, and they see them as a fundamental part of China's geo strategy writ large, right? And so while we, while Africa has remained below the bottom of our priority list, right? If you think of the American priority list, it takes a while till you get to Africa. China has prioritized Africa. Now here is an interesting upshot, though. The what is it? The it's a C E I S, it's Keese, right? Crease, Crease, maybe is the way. It's the it's like the Central European Institute studies whatnot. I'm sure I can get it for you. Anyway, these guys did a study where they looked at perceptions of China and perceptions of the U.S. and Africa and Latin America, and they were shocked by the findings because China was seen predominantly, you know, positively across the board. But America was seen higher in every African country that they surveyed. They had 12 countries. And so here's a weird situation, right? China has invested all of this into making Africans think better of China. America has neglected China, Africa, put almost nothing into it, but Africans still generally perceive the US better. You could imagine if we actually put a little into the relationships, right, what we would get. So, has China mitigated negative views? Maybe, because views of China and Africa are better than views of China in Europe and the US. So maybe they have mitigated those negative views, but we'll never know that, right? That's a known unknown, okay? But what we do know is that they, they prioritize Africa and they put money into it. Very good, other My questions? Plant. We have one right here. That was like my plant question over there. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so you mentioned some of the U US policy against China is raising the cost for like potential invasion towards Taiwan. Mm -hmm. um, in your opinion, are there some, of, some things that Taiwan itself can do to also raise the cost besides military preparation? Because a lot of time I feel like our hands are pretty tied, and we're just sitting and waiting for things to happen. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, Taiwan is a, a small island, um, but it has a variety of different strategic advantages, and I'm not a military expert, okay? So the things I'm going to say are just things that I've either heard or kind of put together, but it's not something that I've sat down and said, how to defend Taiwan, right? So I'll just do my best with the question. The very first thing that Taiwan can do is make it hard for China, like raise the costs in terms of making sure, I think they've actually done this already, increase the, um, the time Taiwanese have to spend in the military, right? I think they increased it from four months to a year, right? And they're trying to make that training more specific to actual um, asymmetric warfare, right? And so that's the very first thing you have to do. You've got to, you know, make people better and more prepared to fight, right? And you've got to get that mentality, right? This idea that if we're gonna you know, do the so-called porcupine strategy, well, we have to be prepared mentally for that approach, right? Um, and we have to know what's on the line, right? So there's gotta be some measure of awareness building, right? Uh, you would know better than I perhaps how aware the young Taiwan people are about the risks that they face. I've heard everything from people being increasingly aware to people living in denial. Right, you probably know better the state of play. So, you know, building awareness, building preparedness, um, has got to be has got to be key. Um, then there are other kind of asymmetric tactics that Taiwan could could take. Right, for example, if China thinks it's going to take Taiwan and take all these chip foundries, it should be the Taiwan government should make declarative policy. The first thing it's going to do is bomb those chip foundries. The minute you show up on our island, you get not one chip, not one damn chip. 
You not one silicone anything. So you get nothing. That's a zero for you. And that's something you could do, right? Um, you could also come up with also your own kind of deterrence, right? China, and, and I mean, this is going to sound egregious, okay, guys, but when you're trying to deter, the way you do that is by making the cost higher on the other side, right? But Taiwan could signal, either in one way or another, that it would launch missiles at the dams of China. You don't have to hit the Three Gorges Dam with more than one missile. And Taiwan's got a lot, got enough. Maybe that kind of thing needs to be communicated to the Chinese side, right? Taiwan doesn't have to do much to have huge consequences on the mainland. And that's not something that Taiwan would want to do, but if the choice is lose our island or take this action, the, I think you should communicate to Beijing that we would take that action, right? That you will deal with massive consequences, right? right? Um, Taiwan is also a place that has a lot of mountains, right? And a lot of tunnels in those mountains where a lot of military hardware had been in the fight against Japan. I'm sure that there's some there now, right? So stock those mountains up, right? I mean, you can think of a variety of asymmetric tactics, right? Taiwan, and we can go on and on, but it's harder to take than you might think because Taiwan is a place that faces a lot of earthquakes, right, and typhoons. So all the buildings in Taiwan are reinforced, right? They're not just these flimsy things. So, you know, they're pillboxes, right? If you want to take Taiwan, I mean, that's one reason Taiwan's not as pretty as it might be, is because these buildings have to be reinforced in order to withstand, okay? And so it makes it harder for a military to just come in there and take these, these things. So raising the costs, right? Raising the costs. And again, I, I would go on and on and thinking about how to do that, but deterrence. Other questions? Oh, the hard question. Hey. <laughs> Thank you very much, Josh. I always learn so much from you. And I don't disagree at all with the penetrating analysis and, and your prognosis also for our policy. But I want to have, a, have, have you respond to the, the larger question of uh, geostrategic competition and balance of power. Uh, we all learned in first year IR, balance of power. States should balance one against another to advance their interests. Or bandwagon. Uh, yeah, all of that. And um, in the relationship with China, and with this very severe problem of the war in Ukraine, and now a very hostile relation with Russia and a very grave threat of spreading war there, uh, not to speak of the problem of climate change and what do we do with the climate mm -hmm. of this fragile planet. Um, many have said we, we need China's cooperation somehow, not just in terms of economic well-being in this country now, but at the geostrategic level. Uh, and you mentioned Nixon and Kissinger, of course, their famous play, uh, who would have ever thought Nixon and Mao, so worthy of an opera, <laughs> and, uh, and many other uh, literary uh, descriptions and allusions, but it's, it was so stunning. Uh, and who, you know, there's a long argument of whether it was successful or, or whatever. But yeah. so uh, I'm pessimistic, like you are, that anything like this is possible. But it just seems to me that it's in our interest in the United States, uh, trying to prevent the spread of this war to defend Ukraine against the aggressor uh, of Putin and Russia. That, uh, and with this overwhelming global problem of the threats to the environment, that we ought to figure out a way to try to cooperate with them. It's, it's in our interest to find a way to balance China against Russia. Mm -hmm. But what we're doing now seems to be driving them together. Mm -hmm. Now, as you say, there's a lot of internal impulses in China that are going that way already. But I wonder if you could just say a few words about that. Yeah. I wasn't kidding about that hard question, Dave. Um, I believe that there are there are elements in the U.S. which would like to see a rapprochement, right? For sure, right? Uh, Jessica Chen Weiss, uh, uh, John Kerry, probably, through he's the climate change envoy, and um, I'm sure there are others who would want. I mean, remember, Anthony Blinken was about to go to China when the balloon showed up, right? And this. This requires us to ask the question everyone wants us to ask, which is why did the balloon show up? Who sent the balloon? It was funny, in all that analysis, people seem to forget the analogy to history, which was that prior to Nixon's visit 
to China, he sent Alexander Haig, General Alexander Haig, to do a kind of dry run for him. And General Haig got to China and was greeted very, very harshly by the Shanghai leadership. And when he was taken to Hangzhou, he was put on a boat with no food, cold and windy, and he was, he was, he was mistreated. And the lower level officials who were hosting said, what the is going on here? You know, and they called back and they literally had to get to Zhou Enlai's office himself, the premier, and say, what's going on here? And what they found out, and this is later recorded, and I can, if those of you who take my US China class, you can, you can read the recordings. What happened was that Lin Biao, the Minister of Defense, and Mao's wife, Jiang Qing, who were leftists, decided that they wanted to scuttle the US China rapprochement. They were going to undermine it. And it only took a direct intervention from Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai directly to turn up the temperature literally and figuratively on that visit. If not, Nixon may never have gone to China. So my hunch, since you know, I don't have any direct evidence, is that that's a similar to what happened. That there's a group of people, the people who might control things like intelligence balloons, who decided that they wanted to scuttle this and did so. Because why would Xi Jinping himself have invited this person and then scuttled his own visit, right? So my point is, yes, there may be an opportunity, one could say, right? Especially after the 20th Party Congress, which looked a lot like the 9th Party Congress. And right, the 9th Party Congress in 1969 was when Mao Zedong had everybody waving red books and everyone looked fanatical. Well, behind the scenes of that was a US-China rapprochement, okay? Because the Russians were about to invade, okay? But those are not the scenarios we find today. Russia is not about to invade China, quite the opposite, right? Quite the opposite. And there's ample reason to believe that, there's ev that there are people throughout the Chinese system, particularly in the security establishment, who don't want US-China rapprochement to occur. Arguably, there may be some in our security establishment as well. So the point is, I don't, of course, in, my, in a Washingtonism, I don't disagree that there would be some benefits to engagement. The problem is, first, they didn't materialize under the best of circumstances. They're unlikely to materialize under these circumstances. And I do think there's ample effort to undermine and ensure that kind of thing doesn't happen. And then the final problem we have is that climate change is this existential threat to all of us, right? I should have maybe listed that among my systematic, I have to find a way to make that an R or D, right? But climate change, the disaster of climate change, okay. But it's a systemic problem to be sure. The problem is that China doesn't even know how much carbon it's putting up into the air. It can't tell us because it really doesn't know. And it doesn't, I mean, I, I've engaged with enough Chinese interlocutors to know that it's very hard for them to engage us when they themselves don't have the information. Because for years, the Communist Party of China was more progressive than the Republican Party with regard to climate change issues. Hell, they may still be. But their ability to engage us and deliver the results that we need I don't think are there, and their contributions, shall they say, to climate change negotiations in Paris and otherwise have been underwhelming, I think you'd agree. So given their disposition on these things and their inability to enforce, I'm not sure that even under the best of circumstances with the most well-meaning interlocutor who says, I'm gonna do everything I can, I'm still not sure we get past you know, the coffee in terms of actually moving towards getting something done on that issue. Josh, would, would you like to conclude with a couple of fairly simple questions? One is an economic question, the other is a political question. So the economic question is, what are the principal sources of Chinese wealth and are those threatened? The political question is, what's the succession plan? Hold on. Uh, uh, let me take the second one first. There isn't one, okay. <laughs> I, I'm joking, but I'm kind of not, right? I mean, Xi Jinping, there, usually the way that China, well, I shouldn't say usually, the way it had worked for the last two was that people had said, this group, these two people are going to be the kind of premier and general secretary in waiting, okay? And that, that those two people would essentially 
take on certain roles, vice president, vice premier, which would then kind of set them up for accession to leadership later. This is what happened to Xi Jinping, this is what happened to Hu Jintao. But those people who had been thought of as the leaders, well, many of them are now in the jail, right? Mr. Sun was the number one contender, Mr. Sun is in jail, right? So, you know, and, and this is something I think I need to state, right? Because we have this knowledge, and, and it's not entirely wrong, that Mao Zedong was a, a really rapturous guy. And, and look, you know, he was no Mother Teresa. But you know what he was? He was a guy who believed in actually re-educating somebody so that they could get out of the gulag, right? So Deng Xiaoping, who later became the head of China, he was sent to uh, uh, re-education three times. And he came back, okay? Nobody comes back from re-education under Xi Jinping. You're in, you're not out. I don't know that there's, I don't know of any circumstance that somebody has gone in and come out. Now maybe they will. And so this underscores the rightest point I was making before, because this is the same under the Nazis. If you go into the Nazis, you're not gonna see it again, okay? But it also underscores the fact that it's very hard for anybody to stand up and say, I'd like to be the next leader of China. Nothing perhaps could be more risky. So Xi Jinping has very much made it clear, I think, that he's around to stay and discouraged anybody from even conceiving of a future that wouldn't have him in it. So the succession plan, as I understand it, is non-existent. And who knows, right? Xi Jinping could live another 30 years, or he could live another 30 seconds. He's a human being. I, I just have no way to know. But ultimately, what I can tell you is this. The last time somebody died without a succession plan was Mao Zedong, and it took three or four years for China to sort it out, right? Mao's wife was arrested. She was arrested in what, 1976, 77? No, 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 yeah. And then she didn't even go on trial until 1981, okay? They purged the entire system of leftist residuals. It was a mess, the, the, you know, between 78, you know, and this, this was a very, very difficult period in Chinese history, this evolution period after Mao Zedong's death. So I guess the, the way I would conclude this point would be to say it's going to be messy no matter what it is because there isn't a clear succession plan. So when I see Chinese comments on, say, what happened, um, you know, after, um, what was it, on uh, July, June, January 6th, right? Um, I think a lot of that is uh, like schadenfreude to some degree. You know, they're, they're like, oh, my God, it's happening to them, but it could also happen to us. So the last question dealt with the source of Chinese wealth. Is, is any of that threatened? Particularly, I think in the business community, we look at the manufacturing relationships um, and all of those container ships headed east uh, as their source of wealth. As the relationships begin to deteriorate, does that threaten the party or the government itself. Okay, you made a big jump at that last statement. I know. <laughs> I, I know. Um, okay, so to the extent that China's um, moving past prime productivity, then yes, it threatens this kind of idea that, you, that, that had been part of this mantra, which is your life will be better tomorrow than it is today. And this threatens this notion of what I call the Deng deal, the Deng Xiaoping deal, right? You let us run the politics and your economic situation will improve. And so I think that, that there's a tension there. However, China has seen this coming, seen this economic slowdown coming, and has moved to a more security heavy approach to peace and policing, right? So now, even if you're upset for your economic situation, there's 18 cameras surrounding you, you're under constant surveillance, there's almost no way for you to do much, right? Unless you basically throw caution to the wind and come out into the streets like what happened with the zero COVID, and a lot of those people are now in jail, right? So you've gotta be pretty desperate. Three years of lockdown is what it took. That's the level of desperation ultimately it took for people. So no, I don't believe the Communist Party of China is under any direct threat right now. Um, whether or not Xi Jinping himself faces some kind of internal palace problems, who can say? But I do not, I think whatever rules China for the rest of my life is almost certainly gonna call itself the Communist Party of China. Whether it's from the left or the right, whether, whatever it is, it's gonna use that branding. And in terms of the sources of Chinese wealth, 
I mean, it's a big country with a huge amount of resources. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I know um, you should be aware of business professors bearing gifts, okay. but the thank gold, you. Gold bars. Yes, right yes. Thank you for taking the walk across the quad. Thank you for sharing what you know. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Eisenman. Thank you very much. Thank you.